So uh, this is me in 1967, <clears throat> ah. wearing my uh, sombrero from the Mexican Pavilion at Expo 67. I remember the feeling around that time. It was a time when we were redefining ourselves politically, culturally, socially, uh, demographically, and it really felt like the world was open to us as Canadians and that Canada was open to the world. Very exciting kind of time. Um, it was... Uh, a uh, transformative period. Um, we tried to keep that dialogue going, I think, uh, in the excitement that came out of that period. But you know what? It's a tough thing in Canada. In fact, I would argue it's tougher in Canada than it is anywhere else in the world. And that's just because there's not that many of us in such a vast space. I mean, just think about it. Uh, 35 million people in just under 10 million square kilometers is not a whole lot of space, so it's more expensive for us to have the conversation about culture and identity than it is anywhere else in the world, where things travel much more organically, village to village, town to town, uh, and across a, across a small country. Here, uh, we've got to cover that distance with repeater towers and infrastructure and arts grants and national broadcasters and that kind of thing. Uh, and we pay a lot for that, all to tell our story. Now, the thing is, that's the essence of citizenship, I think, is uh, having a national narrative, and I'm, I'm picking up on some themes we've already heard. Um, not only having a national narrative, but feeling yourself to be part of it and that you can contribute to it, that you have a place in it. Now, we're 35 million people from all over the world with our First Nations, with our founding nations, with the United Nations that we've become. It's a real challenge uh, with the scarce resources we have to accomplish the task. So into that void where we don't converse slip some stereotypes that we tend to rely on. I think you know them. Um, and it's not that I have anything against any of these things, it's just that it's not who we are. It really isn't and we've become kind of colonized by this shorthand for ourselves. Well starting in 1995 I wanted to do something about that and have a, a more meaningful symbol that was uh, uh, more flexible, that would offer more opportunities for people to be who they are, tell their story to each other in an evolving way. And I started through a process of research and outreach gathering these pieces that you see here. Now I know they don't look like much and that's because some of these things aren't much. Some of them were construction scrap or picked up off the bottom of Halifax Harbor here. Uh, others are really, really famous. The point is that each and every one of these pieces tells a story and each and every one of these pieces is part of this guitar. In total, I gathered 64 pieces for the original project. 63 of those are in the guitar itself. A 64th was mounted on the strap, and I've since added a few to the case and strap that I can show you later on. We officially nicknamed the guitar Voyageur at the Festival de Voyageur in Winnipeg in February of 2008. I'll say it again, Winnipeg in February, people. <laughs> if you want a Canadian experience, Head out to the Festival de Voyageur. This is Lieutenant Colonel Susan Bahariel of the Canadian Armed Forces who suggested the name uh, Voyageur and we brought her out to the naming ceremony with us there. Uh, quite an experience. So I don't have time to tell you about all the pieces of course, but I can give you a, a little sense of it, take you inside the guitar and give you a, an idea of what the whole project is about. Uh, from Quebec, this giant province that we know for uh, places mainly in the south, you might not know that Nunavik um, is the name of the northern part, the Inuit territory of Quebec. It's pretty sparsely populated in terms of people, very heavily populated in terms of caribou. Uh, so you can imagine caribou is a big part of life in Nunavik, big part of fashion, diet, culture, economy, you name it. I found a young artist from Kujuak in northern Quebec named Charlene Watt, and she carved for us this ulu, a women's knife. It's just a little ornamental one, it's made of uh, a caribou antler with a couple little soapstone rivets there, and this little ornamental ulu is now right in the middle of the fifth fret on this guitar. Now the guy holding the guitar in this picture just happens to be her father, Charlie Watt, who's a senator in Ottawa. A senator so far untouched by scandal. <laughs> Still time, Charlie. 
Um, one of my favorite places in the entire world, the grand old lady of Shooter Street, Massey Hall in downtown Toronto. And not just a great place to hear music, but a very important place in the community. Speeches there by Winston Churchill and the Dalai Lama, boxing matches, the marriage of Tom Longboat, the great uh, first uh, Six Nations uh, runner, Olympic runner. Um, it's a very active concert hall today, although it could have fallen to the Wreckers Ball many years ago. Uh, as part of their ongoing um, sort of transformation and refurbishment, we got one of the seats from up in the gallery section. That seat is now the headstock of the guitar. Uh, this ski was worn in Grenoble, France by Nancy Green, Canada's first multiple Winter Olympic medalist, gold and silver. Uh, in Grenoble, France, uh, again, another senator untouched by scandal so far. Pretty amazing. <laughs> I'm batting two for two. Um, that's a reinforcing strip just on the inside of the guitar. You're looking at the inside back of the guitar there. Uh, not just a great hockey player, but a cultural icon in Quebec uh, and a hero to many, many Canadians. Um, he had kind of a rough year, though, in the 54-55 season when he was suspended by the league commissioner, Clarence Campbell. Um, when he came back the next year uh, to take back the cup from Detroit, it began a string of five Stanley Cups in a row for Montreal. Now, at the time, if you were on a Stanley Cup winning team, the league would give you a silver platter, uh, which looked terrific at home, but the Richard family wanted something a little bit sexier. So they commissioned for the whole team the very first ever set of Stanley Cup rings. Uh, this is the one uh, commissioned for Maurice himself. You can see his number nine and name in the Stanley Cup and all that. My friend Dave bought this ring at an auction in 2004. He paid $8,000 US for it. I know his wife thought that was a mistake. Um, <laughs> but then he made the bigger mistake of telling me that he'd bought it. Uh, and I begged and pleaded and took it down to Harborfront Center in Toronto where a jeweler named Bevan Jennings uh, cut off a tiny bit of gold from the bottom of the ring. You'd never know it's gone. It's now right in the middle of the ninth fret in what to me looks like one of Maurice Richard's eyes coming down the ice at you. Uh, so the white of the eye is moose antler from Pick River First Nation and Lake Superior. The blue is labradorite from Nain Labrador, and then that little pupil of gold right in the center. Uh, this piece uh, was part of the original gateway of Fantan Alley, Canada's first Chinatown in Victoria, BC. It's now an inside piece connecting the top to the sides of the guitar. On the uh, pick guard assembly here, this top element is a piece of wood taken from uh, the cabin of John Ware, uh, the first black cowboy in Alberta, very successful entrepreneur who died in 1905, 12 days after Alberta became a province and was the biggest funeral the young city of Calgary had ever seen. Uh, the stem of the maple leaf consists of four pieces, but you've already heard telegraph. The one on the left there is the top of Paul Henderson's stick from the 1972 Canada-Russia series. Our 15th and 17th Prime Minister, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, and it doesn't really matter how you felt about him politically, but around that time in 1967, he was, I think, part of that change in how we saw ourselves. Uh, he definitely changed the game of what it meant to be a politician in Canada, and I think a lot of that had to do with this <coughs> impression of him as a real outdoorsman, a real, uh, somebody very connected to the Canadian landscape. Uh, I wanted to honor that part of his life somehow in the project, uh, and was able, with the help of uh, young Justin Trudeau, to obtain uh, one of his uh, canoe paddles um, uh, that was found left behind at the old summer house. Uh, that canoe paddle is now <coughs> the tone bar just inside the top of the sound hole there. Now, what amazes me, it doesn't matter where we go in the country, this is one of the pieces that a lot of people want to touch, although especially women for some reason, I find. <laughs> Not sure why that is. Uh, a little serious. <coughs> Uh, Prime Ministerial mojo still going on there. Um, a little bit less mojo, perhaps, but uh, uh, Prime Minister nonetheless, our very first, uh, a piece of his uh, um, side table um, from his office on Parliament Hills in the guitar. Uh, that was obtained for us uh, with the help of Gerald Keddy from here in Nova Scotia, as well as a Toronto Senator, Concilio Danino, also untouched by scandal. Man, three for three. Quite amazing. Um, from here in Nova Scotia, you might want to know, uh, first of all, that this is where the guitar was built. It was built uh, down on the South Shore near Bridgeport in Pinehurst, Nova Scotia, uh, by a talented luthier named uh, George Rosani, from whom I commissioned once I got all these pieces in place. Uh, among the other pieces, uh, this one is from um, uh, Pier 21. It's one of the rafters from just down the, 
the, the shore here in the, at Pier 21, uh, a building that, in fact, George Rosani and his family came through from Hungary in 1956. Uh, this charred piece of wood is from um, a building that had kind of a tragic turn in the, ha in the Halloween night of 2001, uh, St. John's Anglican Church in Lunenburg that burned down. We got one of those pieces. It, of course, uh, had a terrific recovery and has been since rebuilt. Uh, that's another interior piece. In many parts of the guitar, you'll find this that was also um, the subject of a uh, wonderful um, recent refurbishment, <laughs> the Blue Nose II. Uh, so that's uh, on the neck and on the top block and end block and other decorative elements of the guitar. From, uh, from over there in Cape Breton, uh, some Sydney steel um, representing the late and once powerhouse steel industry of Cape Breton. Uh, and finally, this... Uh, Hello. This piece here uh, is something that was from an idea that was, came from a, a very famous, prominent uh, Nova Scotian historical figure, and it's something that continues to make news here in Nova Scotia, and I'm going to let the person who contributed that tell us the story of this piece. Come on. Hello, I'm Delvani Bernard. I'm from Halifax, Nova Scotia, and I'm a citizen of the Six String Nation. I'm standing here in the site of the remains of the old Nova Scotia home for colored children, which was an orphanage from 1929 right up until about the 80s. There's scarcely a family from Yarmouth clean clear through to Sydney that doesn't have a personal story about the Nova Scotia home for colored children. I always marveled at this building because not only did it seem incredibly big, but also I knew that is where my father grew up. My father and his four sisters came to the home for colored children when he was 12 years old. I think that the home is in many ways a symbol of the life that existed here at that time in the sense that the society was so socially segregated, there was a need to have a separate orphanage for African Nova Scotian children. I was able to retrieve this from over the doorpost. And as you can see, it's not even properly or fully milled. And so this would have been inserted in this building somewhere about the time of its construction in the late 1920s. It wouldn't be a Canadian guitar if it didn't have a piece of African Nova Scotian history in it. Because we have helped build this country from the ground up along with all the other founding cultures of Canada. That's the, uh, the home there, of course, and it's now um, this piece inside the top of the guitar, uh, on the inside of the guitar, just above Trudeau's paddle there. This is perhaps the most extraordinary story of all. Um, this tree, uh, that's not a Photoshop picture, maybe slightly, but uh, uh, it's a completely albino Sitka spruce tree a tree with no chlorophyll in its needles. Uh, it really shouldn't have survived, but it did. It lived for 300 years and grew to 120 feet tall. And it was important to all kinds of communities, the scientific community, the tourist community, and all kinds of people, but especially important to the Haida people. This is on Haida Gwaii off the west coast of British Columbia. For them, this was a sacred tree, said to contain the spirit of one of their ancestors, a small boy. They called it Kid Kias, the golden spruce. And unfortunately, in 1997, a logging scout from Macmillan Blodell, who had come to think of his company as hypocritical, decided to make a statement about, his, about their hypocrisy. And the form of his protest was that he paddled across the Hecate Strait in the middle of the night and uh, cut down this tree. It took three days for this tree to fall. And the Hyde people I met said that for them this was a drive-by shooting, a murder of someone in their community. And they vowed at that point they would never cut into it again. They would just let it return to the earth in spirit and substance. It remained that way on the ground for nine years. But in 2004, Dr. David Suzuki uh, introduced me to some folks in the community on Haida Gwaii with the aim to possibly getting a piece for the guitar. We had a dialogue that took about 18 months, and it ended up with us going into the forest in February of 2006 with a Haida carver named Leo Gagnon and an elder named Frank Collison. And together, we were the first people to cut into this tree since it had been felled. It was a tremendous honor and an extraordinary experience. And beyond that, the piece of wood that came out of this tree was perfect. 
absolutely perfect. It is now, he said dramatically, the entire top of the guitar. So it's really the face and the voice of this project, and it could not be any better. The guitar made its debut on Canada Day 2006 on Parliament Hill in the hands of Stephen Fearing, today a Halifax resident. Uh, his song, The Longest Road, was one that I dreamed for 11 years would be the first song sung on this guitar. And in fact, uh, the guitar was played by all of the artists who were on the bill that day on Canada Day. And we returned there as part of the Canada Day show uh, for the next four years, participating both with our portrait uh, feature in Major Majors Hill Park, uh, on Parliament Hill for the big show. Um, we've done other events for the Na National Capital Commission, including Winterlude and others. Uh, since then, we've clocked over 300,000 kilometers going back and forth across the country and taking it to all kinds of events and sharing it with all kinds of people in all kinds of communities, returning it to places uh, that it is related to or places that it's come from, like Fantan Alley or uh, the Big Nickel in Sudbury that's in the guitar. And it's been an occasion for everyone to participate in their own way uh, and to find their own story in it. That's the, uh, the Eau de l'Acadie show in Caraquette. Done lots of school events. It's been honored with all kinds of things, oddly enough, even with a math problem in a textbook <laughs> for Western Canada, something I didn't expect. I was told there would be no math. Um, <coughs> uh, a great mural there on the back of Lee's Palace in Toronto, odd things like cookies. Uh, and of course, it's been through the hands of so many uh, Canadians, uh, each of whom has their own story to tell uh, and each of whom offers their story in return, which has been one of the great uh, delights for me. Now, we do occasionally let politicians hold it. Um, your uh, famous um, defense minister here actually gave us what we considered our very best politician rock star pose, <laughs> until the former mayor of Toronto gave us this one. Um, our current mayor could not do this if he tried. <laughs> And we did give him the opportunity, uh, but he was coaching football that day, I think, so. Um, uh, you know, all kinds of politicians, uh, the current Ontario Premier, and of course Jack Layton was a guitar player and uh, played this guitar on, on several occasions. Uh, it's been played by uh, rock stars and pop stars and rap stars and uh, up-and-coming artists uh, and musicians from all kinds of different cultural backgrounds. Uh, in every part of the country, at all kinds of events in every part of the country. Uh, that's a real thrill for me. Uh, lots of um, Atlantic-based artists as well have had their hands on this guitar. Um, good old Lenny Gallant uh, is actually reflected in the guitar. Jill Barber is a left-hander player, so she can't actually play it, but she's delightful. Uh, good old Buck 65. And of course, some of Canada's most beloved uh, artists have played it and held it as well. Stomp and Tom sang Bud the Spud on it, I can tell you. Um, now, naturally, I wanted Chris Hadfield to take this guitar up to the space station with him. That wasn't really an option, partly because of the Soyuz capsule uh, uh, limitations on size, partly because he already had this Larave guitar waiting for him up there, and partly because, as he informed me, the splashdown might be a little rough uh, on my guitar. <laughs> um, uh, however, we did get together, and uh, he uh, played the guitar for a few songs. Uh, and at the end of our little visit, he presented me with his mission patch, um, which he designed himself. Uh, you will notice that it is in the shape of a guitar pick. Uh, on that note, you know, I have to say that this guitar is not simply a reliquary of things. It's a living document. Um, every time uh, musicians pick it up, um, it sort of takes on a new story, and each, uh, each of its components comes to life in its own way. And to do that, I'm going to ask back uh, Jacques Gautreau uh, to sort of bring some life into this. Now, uh, while Jacques is, is playing, I'm going to go show you some of the portraits that we've done. We've now done about 150,000 portraits of about 15,000 different people holding this guitar in every province and territory of Canada. And what I love the most about it is that we do multiple shots with everyone. They come up into this white space that we take around to festivals and other events. Here. Is that okay for you to? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. And 
each of them, whether they play the guitar or not, holds it, reflects for a moment on what it means to them, and uh, really brings it to life and becomes part of its story and shares their story with us. Ladies and gentlemen, Jacques Cotreau, once again. Listen up, kid, it's not what you think. Stayed up too late, had a little too much to drink. Walk home across the bridge when the marquee shut down. There's a reason why I love this town. Nobody cares how much money you have. If you've got enough to get in a cab, there'll be drinks on the house. Your house burns down There's a reason why I love this town I saw your band In the early days We all understand Why you moved away But we'll hold a grudge I shot the shit with miniature Tim If he needs a song, well I'll write one for him We like the same jokes and we like the same sounds There's a reason why I love this town Well I played a show in Kelowna last year Pick it up Joel, we're dying in here Picture one and clapping, now picture half that sound there's a reason why I hate that town Oh, if you saw my band In the early days You'd all understand Why we moved away But we'll hold a grudge anyway Because it's fun Davy and me face down in our soup in some French restaurant outside the Riviere du Loup. Last night of the tour, we burnt the place to the ground. There's a reason why I love this town. There's a reason why I love this town. There's a reason. There's a reason why I love this town There's a reason why I love this town
<laughs> Brilliantly done. Brilliantly done. A perfect choice. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Eck. Gee, you know, I might have a new, uh, a new favorite, although in strong contention is standing on the banks of the Yukon River hearing John K. Sampson singing I Hate Winnipeg. Um, uh, I'll, I'll measure that later. Uh, if you want to find out more about the project, lots online at sixstringnation.com, including links to all our social media platforms, et cetera, et cetera. Lots more videos like the ones you saw of uh, Delviner Bernard. Um, if you see this coin, uh, the Royal Canadian Mint did this coin in honor of the project back in 2009. It's a 50 cent piece, it costs $34.95, but I think they sold out, so if you find it, buy it. Uh, the book is available here today, uh, so if you'd like to buy one, they're out in the um, lobby and I will happily sign copies for you. Uh, I want to thank, um, well, a ton of people for helping to make this project possible including the people who stood in its way, because in a way they made it better, and there were lots of those. Um, but I really, really want to thank um, Peter and the whole gang here at the uh, 2017 uh, Starts Now conference for inviting me to take part here uh, and in Charlottetown and, and coming up in Ottawa. It's, it's a great idea to get us together to have this conversation. Thank you so much. <laughs>